Special thanks to Squarespace for sponsoring this video. On the morning of October 5th, 1959, the Russian embassy in France sent out an urgent communique that the West had a new fighter jet and it was the fastest plane in the world. But it wasn't the Americans that came up with this insane aircraft, but the French. Setting the world record as the fastest jet fighter and the fastest moving human ever, this plane raised the heat of the Cold War and made the Soviet supersonic bomber program obsolete overnight. The secret to its success? An incredible duo engine system, a ramjet and a turbofan that could push it beyond Mach 3. That's right, it's even faster than the famous MiG-25 Foxbat. But how did the French come up with such a radical design and how did such a miracle aircraft set now on the world stage become abandoned and lost to history? This is the incredible guardian of the North, the Nord 1500. Taxiing on the grassy field after its record-breaking flight, many of the reporters remarked that it looked like a ramjet engine with a cockpit stapled to the top. And ironically, they couldn't have been closer to the truth. The French had decided that this would be an engine platform first and a Soviet bomber interceptor second, and this was reflected in its insane design. The air intake for its powerful engine system would be massive to funnel as much unobstructed air into the ramjet as possible. And multiple times during its development, they had to rebuild it. Should we back off? Should we play it safe? Nah, you think let's make it bigger. This air intake would both fuel the ramjet and its turbofan, technically two different engines on one little plane. And the reason was that this ramjet, which I'll go into detail later, can't actually be used until the plane was up to speed. So a more familiar turbojet would be used to fly the plane up to the sound barrier. Once the jet was going past Mark 1, it would activate its ramjet and get it up to Mark 2.1, with future designs up to Mark 3. But that's not all, this plane would also be a delta wing, allowing it to push faster with lower drag and as such it wouldn't have a horizontal tailplane. The cockpit, although looking very janky on top, was perfectly positioned for high forward visibility, as well as side to side. It was intended to be fully pressurized and equipped with an ejection seat for safety. In front of it was a very large nose cone that would house an advanced radar and there were two small canards side by side. These were not movable and not used for agility but rather to stop the damn plane flying head first into the ground thanks to its insanely powerful engines. After all, this was a bomber interceptor made to chase after those super fast Soviet bombers not get into dogfights with other fighters. The upper sections of the deep fuselage would also serve as the storage area for fuel. To facilitate ground running and the ability to land and take off from grassy airstrips, a fully retractable tricycle undercarriage was employed and explains why the Nord Aviation, the engineers behind this jet fuel madness, opted to test it exclusively on grassy fields instead of typical runways. So you're probably asking, why did the French believe that a normal jet wouldn't do and that this insane ramjet would be needed? As the engineers worked on this jet, they realized just how thirsty the engine was, meaning they had to turn back to the drawing board. Just like you should with your business website, because Squarespace's new fluid engine has arrived. But hold on, don't skip this part as I'll have some sneak peeks in for future videos. Start with a best-in-class website template and customize every design detail with reimagined drag-and-drop technology for desktop or mobile, so you don't have to make two sites. And you can stretch your imagination online with the Fluid Engine, built in and ready to go with any new Squarespace site. Plus, that's not all. With every Squarespace website can have built-in shops to start selling right away, or you can use the campaign marketing tools to start driving business instantly. Seriously, Squarespace is the secret weapon that even I use for my online store, which is www.foundandexplained.shop. Thanks, Squarespace. 
So if you want to support the channel and see more cool videos with 3D animation just like this and get 10% off your first site and domain, go to www.squarespace.com found. I'm excited for your success and a special warm hug to all those who click the link helping make videos just like this. I do truly love this era of the 1950s where no crazy engine design was off limits and the ramjet was one of them. In a ramjet, the high pressure is produced by ramming external air into the combustor using the forward speed of the vehicle. The external air that is brought into the propulsion system then becomes the working fluid, much like the turbojet engine. But differently, in a turbojet engine, the high pressure of the combustor is generated by a piece of machinery called the compressor. But there are no compressors in a ramjet, therefore making ramjets lighter, more powerful, and more simpler than a turbojet. At a great cost. A ramjet cannot produce static thrust, and some other propulsion systems must be used to accelerate this vehicle to a speed begins to produce thrust. The higher the speed of the plane, the better the ramjet works. Hence why they needed two engines to get this interceptor up to a thousand kilometers an hour. Ironically, this ramjet doesn't actually operate like a turbofan, as in there's no controls and simply an on and off switch. This would mean that the Nord 1500 would not have a specific top speed, but rather they would switch it on and hold on to dear life, like some sort of fast and furious nitro switch. Once the jet had been caught up to Soviet bombers, it would use some anti-air missiles to blow them out of the sky and return home before the camera bear had burned in the oven. So how on earth did we get here? It begins back in 1959 with the Soviet panic. The development of this super jet fighter was spurred on at the beginning of the 1950s. With the ever-present threat of Russian supersonic bombs on the horizon with a deadly nuclear cargo, the French sought new and exciting ways to intercept them. The government opened a competition to various aerospace firms with the idea that the best concept would take the cake. This future interceptor would need to be fast, record speed fast, and it would also need to be able to take off from grassy airfields. Using the research that the team had developed with the Delta Wing, Nord Gerfont concept, am I saying that right? They leaped into action to make essentially a jet fighter version. With initial plans approved, friends in the French government pushed the project through before the contest had even finished, and I'll get back to that point in a minute. On August 24, 1953, a duo of prototypes were commissioned, although the official contract was not issued until much later in 1955. Although Nord had long-term plans for these aircraft to fulfill the need for a lightweight interceptor capable of operating from grassy airfields, two planes were initially ordered without any military equipment. They were solely intended for research purposes. The first, dubbed the Griffin 1501, took to the skies in 1955. It managed to achieve a maximum speed of Mark 115 during its inaugural supersonic flight on January 11, 1956. And this was just with the turbofan. They had yet to install its ramjet. At some point during its operational life, the air intake was enlarged, likely during the installation of a more potent ATAR 101E engine, before the aircraft reached its peak speed of Mach 1.3 at an altitude of 8,000 meters. Although initially test flights revealed diminishing engine performance above 9,000 meters, the aircraft exhibited exceptional handling characteristics. But during flight testing, it became evident that the aircraft suffered from a lack of power, which was further exasperated by the cancellation of plans to incorporate the intended ramjet propulsion system due to the delivery of the second prototype, the Griffin II. This plane had that famous ramjet and boy did it go fast, but just not fast enough, barely matching the speed of the Griffin 1. This was because, again, that ramjet was too damn 
thirsty. Ironically, this larger intake didn't let in even enough air, and yet again the engineers returned to the drawing board, increasing the diameter again almost to a comical size, allowing this jet to finally start to push beyond the record set by the Griffin 1. And let's talk about that record. On October 5th, 1959, the Griffin 2 set an impressive speed record, reaching a remarkable velocity of 2,320 kilometers per hour. Additionally, while under the control of the pilot, Andre Tukat, it achieved a peak speed of Mach 2.19 and an altitude of 15,000 meters. Impressed by this insane performance, the United States Air Force provided some financial support for the flight testing, which continued until 1960. The engineers, such as chief designer Jean Gaultier, got excited and designed an even faster version of the plane called the Griffin III that would potentially fly up past Mark III and easily beat the future record setter, the MiG-25 Foxbat. It looked like the future had arrived for France and Nord Aviation. But alas for Nord Aviation, there was trouble on the horizon. There were a few problems with this plane, and one of them was the material science of the aircraft proved to be a little bit too melting for the sheer amount of heat that the engines provided. Whilst a more alternative material like titanium could have been used to ensure its performance at these top speeds, titanium was very expensive and almost non-existent back in this era. Thus, this plane was going to be very expensive. And that's exactly what you don't want to hear when your country is involved in ongoing conflicts in Africa, particularly in Algeria, and the challenges faced by Vietnam had strained the French military budget to its limits. Consequently, a super fast ramjet fighter just like this one was deemed unnecessary for combating these adversaries, who were flying much cheaper steel MiGs in smaller numbers. So the powers that be looked to more traditional aircraft like the Dassault Mirage, which met the project requirements without incurring these excessive costs. So Nord Aviation was given the nod and the project was cancelled. But fear not, much of this research and even the test pilot would transfer to a passenger version where that would become the famous Concorde, setting records yet again. But this wasn't the only insane project that entered this competition. An impressive inventor called Le Duc would set their sights on an even bigger monster plane that could fly Mach 5, even quicker than this. And the best part is, you can watch it right now on the video. Trust me, this one has spies, espionage and romance. I'll link it down below. Thanks for watching.